January 14th, 1942. It's a little over one month after the U.S. entry into World War II when a single B-18 bomber lifts off from Westover Airfield in Massachusetts. This particular bomber is the B-18A variant, tasked with an anti-submarine patrol targeting German U-boats prowling the shipping lanes for U.S. supply ships. The crew is far from experienced, with the officers being trained for the B-24 rather than the B-18, and the entire crew being pieced together for this specific assignment. Piloting the aircraft is 1st Lieutenant Anthony Benvenuto alongside his co-pilot 2nd Lieutenant Woodrow Kantner with 2nd Lieutenant Fletcher Craig as the plane's navigator. Private 1st Class Robert Picard mans the B-18's defensive machine guns along with Private Raymond Lawrence. The last two of the eight-man crew were Private Richard Chubb, the mechanic, and Private Noah Phillips, the plane's bombardier. However, unbeknownst to the crew, their mission that day would not be the reason this flight would be remembered. Following an unsuccessful patrol, the bomber would turn back towards home at around 4.30 p.m. with its payload still inside. With the B-18 beginning its return flight, this ill-fated crew would quickly lose visibility as the plane found itself flying into rapidly worsening conditions. With a strong headwind against them, the pilots set the aircraft at an altitude of 4,000 feet, attempting to stay out of the overcast skies and clear of any obstacles between them and their home base. Visibility completely lost, and the sun sinking below the horizon, the interior of the plane was plunged into darkness. With the wind far stronger than the crew believed, and all their instruments essentially useless due to the weather and darkness, they had no way of knowing how far they were drifting from their intended course. Desperately trying to find something, anything, to give them an idea of their location, the two pilots and navigator must have been overjoyed when a momentary break in the clouds revealed the lights of a city. Confident that what they were seeing was Providence, Rhode Island, they adjusted to a northwesterly course which would bring them back to their home base. The men had no way of knowing that what they had actually seen were the lights of Concord, New Hampshire, and this final mistake would seal the fate of the aircraft and her crew. With the weather worsening and ice building up on the wings of the bomber, things only got worse for the struggling pilots. Fighting to keep the plane at altitude, the airspeed slowly fell to 160 miles an hour with the two engines straining with the increasingly heavy aircraft. Trying to alleviate some of the icing and still unaware of their true location, Benvenuto dropped to 3,800 feet. At just over the three-hour mark since turning back for home, co-pilot Kantner noticed what he at first thought were dark clouds. Flicking on the landing lights to try and get a better view, his stomach must have dropped as he realized that it was not a cloud, it was a mountain. Yelling to Benvenuto to pull up, he yanked back on the stick, but the pilot was unable to hear him and it was already too late. With a downdraft hitting the plane, the laboring engines finally stalled. At around 8 p.m., the bomber crashed into the side of Mount Waternomi. The plane cut its way into the trees, traveling a total of around 70 yards before finally coming to a rest. Along the way, it would lose one wing entirely, including the engine attached to it, with the other being partially severed past the engine. Although the crash had somewhat been softened by the snow, the now mangled aircraft, still full of fuel with a hot, damaged engine, would burst into flames just moments after the crash. As the flames spread towards the bomb bay, what came next would almost certainly seal the fate of anyone left on board. With the inevitable explosion being felt over 22 miles away, what happened next is even more remarkable. With visible flames on the mountain, people in the nearby towns of Lincoln and Woodstock quickly took action. At least one of them, a woman named Franciana Huat, actually saw the aircraft pass overhead just before it crashed. Following the crash, she quickly drove to the police chief's house to report what she had witnessed just before hearing another explosion. Within less than half an hour of the crash, not only were calls sent out to the state police, forest service, army, and civilian volunteers, but rescue parties had begun to climb towards the crash site. First into the woods was a group of 12 volunteers, including Neil McInnes, Paul Dovhuluk, Robert Kelly, Everett Kinn, and Charles Doherty. Making their way up the mountainside in the dark and through snow was hard enough, but with fallen trees from a hurricane in 1938, it was a tough climb. Reportedly, one member of the search party ended up chest-deep in snow at one point after sliding in between two fallen trees. Three miles into the climb, they began calling out, hoping to hear a response from a survivor. 
Finally, after about three hours, as they drew closer to the downed aircraft, they began to hear faint cries for help answering them. Unbelievably, they would find five of the seven airmen alive with varying degrees of injuries. Lieutenant Craig was mostly uninjured, but the others had more severe injuries including broken bones and the pilot, Lieutenant Benvenuto, crawling away from the wreck, his back broken. Lieutenant Craig, Private Chubb, and Lieutenant Kantner were found attempting to make their way down towards the light of the town below, around a mile from the crash, whereas Lieutenant Benvenuto and Private First Class Picard were found closer to the crash, being unable to go further due to their injuries. Sadly, they would be the lucky ones, with the remaining two crew members, Private Lawrence and Private Phillips, being killed either in the crash or when the plane caught fire and exploded. Their bodies were later found inside a portion of the wreckage. With other volunteers reaching the crash site and the survivors, they did what they could to administer first aid. A young physician named Dr. Alan Handy would later arrive after the five survivors had been found by the initial group and would give better treatment to the two men who were unable to be moved. The three survivors who were still mobile began the trip down the mountain assisted by members of the first 12 volunteers, with the other two being cared for on the mountain until toboggans could be brought to get them down safely. For the time being though, they were kept warm by two fires started, one for each man, while being cared for by the volunteers and Dr. Handy. At around 12.30 a.m., the group helping the three survivors down the trail ran into another team led by Sherman Adams, including rangers from the Forestry Service. Receiving more details on what had happened, the group radioed the information down the mountain and Adams called for the state police to go to a nearby lumber camp to get woodsmen who could clear a trail to the crash site, thus allowing the remaining men to be brought down. From there, it took until around 2 a.m. to get the three survivors to the Sawyer Highway. It wouldn't be until around two hours later that the remaining survivors began the trip down the mountain. Progress was incredibly slow and painful for the two severely wounded airmen, with it taking until 10 a.m. to finally get them to the highway. In total, from the moment of the crash, the rescue work would last around 14 hours, working through darkness and snowy weather. With the survivors off the mountain and a very real threat posed by potential unexploded ordnance still on the plane, the area was declared off-limits. Several of the volunteers would stand guard until army personnel eventually arrived and took control of the site. This would not stop one photographer from trying his luck to snag photos of the aircraft. Unfortunately for him, this resulted in his camera being confiscated, but luckily for us, the photos survived, showing us what the crash looked like the following day. The incredible survival of nearly all the crew was later credited to the last-minute actions of Kantner who kept the plane from slamming nose-first into the mountain. The following day, the Army would locate one remaining unexploded 300-pound bomb and detonate it on site, thus removing the danger. After removing the Norden bomb site from the remains of the aircraft, it was determined unnecessary to remove the remaining pieces of the plane and the site was abandoned by the military. The five surviving airmen would eventually all continue their service after recovering from their injuries. Ironically, Kantner would end up being lucky to have been in the crash, as had he returned to base without incident, he would have died in a separate plane crash on a return flight to his home base in California. Of the five survivors, four would survive the war, with Anthony Benvenuto dying when he was shot down over Asia in a B-24. Sherman Adams, a member of the rescue effort, would later go on to become the governor of New Hampshire, and Paul Duff Hollock, just one day after helping rescue the stranded men on the mountain, would enlist into the military himself on January 16, 1942. He would go on to be assigned to the legendary 101st Airborne, later receiving a Bronze Star and being severely wounded in the Battle of the Bulge, but would ultimately survive the war. The full story of his actions deserve a video of their own though, so we'll just leave it there for now. Today, exactly 80 years after this tragic crash, you can still visit the site of the wreck on Mount Watanomi. What you are seeing now, and may have seen throughout earlier parts of the video, is footage I took after hiking to the site last year. Much of the parts are almost unrecognizable, but incredibly, some of the plane still has the original paint. Although the trail is far from the struggle the men braved in 1942, you can get some idea of just how incredible this story is by doing the trek yourself.
It's one thing to hear some guy on YouTube talk about an event like this, but it's an entirely different experience to go and make the climb yourself. I do warn you though that the trail is deceptive as you start on a fairly flat road which quickly becomes a fairly steep climb once you get off into the woods. I would definitely not suggest this as a first hike for someone who has never done one before, but if you have enough time and determination, just about anyone could do it. Just don't do it after it rained like my dad and I did as it was quite slippery. Unfortunately, I didn't get us sliding on camera. I'll leave information if you'd like to plan a trip to the site yourself someday down in the description. Please remember to respect the site and don't try to take pieces of the aircraft as a souvenir. Not only is it on federal land which could result in a fine, but it's disrespectful to the two men who lost their lives there. Regardless of if you choose to visit the site or not though, the incredible story of the men who both survived the crash and those who went to their aid is without a doubt history worth remembering.